Hi, my name is Deb Carson, and I've been a member of FIRST for about 18 months. I always laugh because I consider myself a recovering Catholic, and, and when I got here, I found other people like that, and it was, was nice. It was refreshing to know that people weren't born here and raised here, that people came here from all different walks of life. I never ever got Christ. I never, I, I never understood. All I knew was growing up, um, I knew that purgatory was real important. I knew that if I didn't make friends that cared about me, they wouldn't pray for me so that I would go to heaven. And I never could understand that. So I just felt phony. Well, I gotta make people like you so they'll pray for you. So when you're in purgatory, you, you'll go to heaven. I didn't get that. I probably still don't get that. So I never, I never had a loving God. I've never, I never grew up with a loving God. I grew up with a condemning God a God that looked for you to make mistakes. And uh, so I always found myself making commercials, doing commercials going, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm a good person. And uh, so as far as I believed in God, I've always believed in God. But understanding Jesus Christ, I honestly don't believe I understood Jesus Christ until I came to this church. In fact, I know that. I think the morning that I came here, back in November 3rd, I believe it was, in 2015, that changed my whole life. I walked into this church, it felt, it felt um, comfortable. People felt real and nice, and uh, I guess that's something that I had never, nobody was putting on a show, nobody was doing the, and what was really great is we had people in t-shirts and tennis shoes, we had people in dresses, we had, it was just amazing, um, the different things. You know, I grew up in church and you had to be all in formal clothes and stuff like that. You know, I spent 26 years in the military and I never was afraid in the military as much as I was when I walked into the Catholic church. So it was a fear that I had. It wasn't, it wasn't like walking into a church to um, be saved or be with God. I went there because I was supposed to. I went there because I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't understand um, Amazing Grace. I understand Amazing Grace now. I understand Amazing Grace because of people like Pastor Josh and my friend Teresa and and all of you here at first. I remember my friend Teresa, whom I hadn't seen in over a decade, and she I invited her to Sunday brunch and she said, Well, how about you come with me to church first and then we can go have lunch? And this is where she brought me. And I remember walking into church, every church I've ever gone to, I always walked in tough and knowing what was going to happen. And how I'm feeling right now is how I felt the morning that I came to this church. I was just so overwhelmed and so full of, of just everything, of the spirit. I knew this was home. I knew this is where I needed to be. I'm glad I'm here and I know I'll never leave. Um, I hope you have a great Easter and God bless you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am. Um, I mentioned earlier I am Pastor Josh, and I uh, I love Deb's story. Um, I have the privilege. Uh, my wife and I have the privilege. Uh, Deb's in our small group, and so I get to uh, every couple of weeks we get together, and I get to hear a little bit more of that story every time we get together and see what God has done in her life. And I love that she found a place. And and our mission here at the church is where people where we can follow Jesus and we can help other people find Jesus. And that's what we're about. That's what we care about the most. And so I love Deb's story and how just a simple invite, hey, you want to come to church with me? And, uh, and she came and God has changed her life and uh, she's got a new purpose in her life. God's doing things in her life and in her and Jim's life. And I'm thankful for that this morning. I, uh, I look at today as just such a, a fantastic day. This is a day that changed history. I'm not overestimating that truth, that this day was the day when everything changed. Had this day, the day of Easter and Jesus being raised back to life, had this day not happened, none of us would be in this room. This church would probably not even be in existence. But the good news is, Jesus was raised back to life. Jesus was raised from the dead and now he's given us power for the same thing and he gives us life eternally with him. 
Uh, I grew up, and uh, I don't know if you saw TV shows or movies or read stories about people coming back to life, maybe a, a movie or something that you saw. I grew up in small towns my whole life, and so one thing that we used to do was there was this kind of rite of passage where you had to, if you walked through the cemetery at nighttime without a flashlight, it was kind of this rite of passage. And uh, I was always afraid to do that. I was one of those chicken kids. I did not do that. That was also around the time that Michael, I'm going to date myself. That was also the time around the Michael Jackson thriller video where they (laughs) came out of the grave and then started doing choreographed dancing. That was just, that was more than I needed in my life at that point in time. And so um, I just remember always being afraid of cemeteries. And then at that same school I went to, they took us to the funeral home. And uh, then they took us into the room where they work on the body and do those things. And I was just, a, that, for me, that was, it weirded me out a little bit. I still remember that room. I still remember as a young boy, probably nine or ten, the layout of that room in Panora, Iowa at the funeral home. But it's always kind of been just an eerie thing. I always wondered, what would happen if you were working on a body and like the toe twitched? Or like the arm moved? Or something happened? Or you were just sitting there and their eyes opened up? What would you do? I was always just afraid of that for some reason. But as we look at this story of Christ, this really shouldn't have been a surprise because Jesus said, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. He told them exactly what was going to happen. He predicted his death, and he predicted his resurrection, and it adds some validity to who he really is. But in this story uh, of Easter and Jesus being raised back to life, let's reverse a little bit to Jesus and what he did. Um, For those of you uh, who aren't as familiar, uh, Jesus was born. We celebrate the birth of Christ during Christmas time. But he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years. And in those 33 and a half years, at the age of 30, he started what we call public ministry. He started ministering to people, helping people, showing compassion and love to them, and really healing people and um, changing their lives. And he he did that for three and a half years, and he developed these things called disciples, and they followed him everywhere he went, and he showed them how to do it, showed them how to love people, showed them how to have compassion. It was just three and a half years of of following Jesus that they had never uh, experienced before. Um, And then, we know on Friday, Good Friday, we, um, we reflect on the day that Jesus died on the cross. And uh, his, his disciples are there, and Peter disowns him three, ti- or, yeah, three times. Jesus is, dies on a cross, and he's laid in a tomb. And I want us to kind of put ourselves in the disciples' mindset for a few minutes, because um, they experienced something they had never experienced before. Their Savior, their leader, is now dead. He's now gone. Was he really who he says he was? Was he really the Messiah? Was he really the Son of God? Was he really all of those things? And so I think of all of the defeat and dejection and discouragement that they must have been feeling. That's a similar feeling that some of us have in lives, uh, in our lives. Um, you've probably been let down by someone in your life, friend, family member, coworker, um, whoever it may be. We've all experienced that defeat or that dejection, really that discouragement of relationships lost in our lives. But the good news about this story about Jesus is that it did not end in the grave. Jesus came back to life. And that's where we're going to pick up this story. So he lived for 33 and a half years. He's been placed in a tomb. He's been dead for a few days. And and if you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter uh, 24. If you don't have a Bible in the chair in front of you, there's a Bible that you can take home with you if you don't have one. But we're going to look on page 498. Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Here's what it says. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Jesus was, um, Jesus had, um, you know, his body was, they assumed, decomposing and starting to to smell. And so they took some spices there. And then it says in uh, verse number two, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? 
He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee. And then it kind of goes back to the words of Jesus. That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. I still don't know how the disciples and the people close to Jesus forgot about that. That's a pretty big story. I'm going to die, and three days later I'm going to be raised from the dead. But somehow many of these people forgot about what that really meant. And then in verse number 8 it says, Then they remembered his words. They actually, then they remembered. They went back to what he had said, that he was going to die and be raised back to life. Um, Jesus came back to life. And uh, he lived on this earth for 40 days. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to share a story about a man named Paul. Because he's an outsider. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't one of the, uh, the followers of Christ. He, he wasn't someone who walked with Christ in those three and a half years of ministry. In fact, he imprisoned and persecuted Christians. That's what he did. He looked for flaws in people. And every time they, they had a flaw, he went ahead and he... Um, he imprisoned them. He persecuted them. And uh, he has this radical conversion. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But if you have a Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read from an outsider's perspective. Someone who didn't walk with Jesus while he was here on this earth. He didn't, he didn't follow Christ during that time. And I love 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because it explains a little bit. And really kind of reminds me of myself, and even hearing Deb share her story kind of reminds me a little bit of her story. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. This is Paul speaking, and he says, For what I received, all the knowledge I've received, all of that I've received in, through relationships, all I've received in revelation from God, all that I've received, I have passed on to you as first importance. Think of it as passing something down to your kids. Something really, really valuable. Something really important. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of who are still living. Though some have fallen asleep or died. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, to one abnormally born. Really, he just, he didn't follow Christ, he wasn't, he, he didn't follow Christ, he was born again after, really, Jesus had passed, um, passed on, and been ascended into heaven. So think for a few minutes, what was Paul's message? He says, what I, what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. Excuse me. I passed on. This is extremely important to me. This is of first importance. Think of your kids. Think of being on your deathbed and saying, this is the most important thing I want you to know. This is of first importance that you know this, that Jesus died for our sins. Jesus never once sinned. Think about that. 33 and a half years and he never sinned one time. If we simplify the meaning of sin, it could be anything that we think anything that we say or anything that we do that displeases God. And he never, ever sinned. In a room this size with those of us in here, there's at least one or two of us that have probably sinned more this morning than Jesus did his whole life in 33 and a half years. But he didn't die for any sins that he committed. He died for everyone else's sin. I want you to think about the magnitude of that for just a second. Everyone who's ever lived, the billions of people who have ever lived on this earth before, he didn't die for anything he did. It's almost like he he stood here and he looked out over billions and billions and billions and billions of people. Trillions. And died for all of their sins, all of our sins. Not because of anything he did wrong. And then it says, he says he was buried. We know from the story of Easter, he was buried in the tomb. He was there for a few days. And then the next thing he says is that he was raised back to life on the third day. The resurrection is extremely vital and important to our faith. If Jesus didn't, wasn't raised from the dead, if Jesus didn't come back to life, what scripture tells us is if that didn't happen, everything else would be futile. If Jesus had come to this earth and lived and done all those wonderful things, if he had done miracles, if he had taught people how to love, do all those things, but he wasn't raised from the dead, none of those things would have really mattered. But he did. 
it validated every part of his life. It validated every prophecy and everything that was said about him over hundreds and really thousands of years. He came back to life. And that was Paul's message. And that's really what our message is. That's my message to, to you. That's my message to the world. That's my message to people I encounter. Anyone who calls themselves or identifies themselves as a follower of Christ is that, that I was a sinner, but Jesus died for me. He forgave me of my sins, and he, he gave me new life. And now I can follow him and spend eternity with him. I love Paul's story uh, as you get to know it a little bit more. But the good news about the story of Jesus is this. The good news of the story of Jesus is that it didn't end in the grave. Everybody thought it was going to end in the grave. In fact, anybody who was well-educated or an intellectual back in that day thought it was foolishness to believe that Jesus could be raised from the dead. They looked down on anybody who would believe such a ridiculous idea. But his life didn't end in the grave. And what he tells us is that our lives don't have to end in the grave either. Uh, I meet people as a pastor all the time who are just really trying to survive life. They've got a, a million things going on in their life. They're, they're running their kids here, running their kids there. They're working a ton of hours every week. They're just floating on through life. And they really don't feel any purpose or meaning in their life. They're just trying to survive making it day to day. I've got to work. I've got to do this. I've got my family. I've got, the, I got these finances I have to pay. I've got bills. I've got a mortgage. I've got all these different things. And a lot of people that I encounter in my life, in my world anyway, as a pastor, people are just trying to survive life. There are people, or there are people like Deb who grew up thinking that life was about following all of these rules and wearing a certain outfit to church. And like she said, as they missed Jesus, that's the thing about Paul. Paul knew everything you could possibly know about God or a lot about God. And he missed Jesus somehow. Legalism drove him. And that was the purpose of his life. But when Jesus revealed himself to Paul, Paul went from a persecutor in the church to a pillar in the church. He went from being someone who went and imprisoned people and persecuted them and, and even killed Christians to now he becomes one of, the, one of the leaders in the church. He wrote a lot of the New Testament or a good chunk of the New Testament. And I love the story of Paul because his life has a brand new purpose and brand new meaning to it that he didn't have before. It changed him forever, just as it changed Deb's life forever, just as it changed my life and many of you in this room. It's changed our lives forever and has the ability to change our lives forever. It gives us a new purpose. Uh, I lived a lot of my life, I didn't, I didn't follow God until I was 18 years old. And um, I had what, what I could call misplaced purpose for my life. I was kind of going about life, not even thinking about God, caring about God or the church, and really just kind of thinking what I knew. You know, I was 18 years old, and when you're 18, you know everything there is to know about life. It usually starts earlier than that, like 12 probably. But uh, I was 18, I knew everything, and uh, I was really just living for myself. I had misplaced purpose. Paul's the same way. Paul was spending his time doing something that really was rejection of God. But now he has a brand new purpose. His life has changed forever. Now he's gone from this persecutor to a pillar in the church. And I want to just encourage you as, we, as we're going to receive communion in just a few moments. But I want to just encourage and ask you the question. Do you know what God's purpose is for your life? Do you know what God's plan is for your life? One of his plans is that we would receive his forgiveness. Uh, Paul's message was that he died on the cross for our sins. And if we think about it, we've, we've thought wrong things, we've said wrong things, and we've done wrong things pretty often. But the good news is Jesus can forgive us of those. And even if you've committed a billion sins in your life, God can forgive you in an instant. And the weight of that sin can come off of your shoulders and he'll give you not just new life in him, but he'll give you a new purpose for your life. Paul looked at his life differently after he became a follower of Christ. Deb looks at her life differently. I, I look at my life. Followers of Christ, they look at their life differently because there's more meaning and purpose behind life. It has a value now that it never had before. And this morning, as, as we prepare to take communion and prepare our hearts for that, 
I think it's important for all of us to, to take a moment here at the end of the message just to, to pause and reflect and respond to what God's speaking to each one of us. Don't think about what God may be speaking to your wife or your kids or people around you, but what is God saying to you as an individual this morning? We know one thing he's saying is what he said through Paul, that Jesus died for your sins because he loves you. He was buried in a tomb because he loves you, and he was raised on the third day because he loves you. And he has a plan for your life and a purpose and meaning behind it. And so this morning, that's what God is offering to each one of us in this room, an opportunity to receive forgiveness and meaning and purpose for our life. God's purpose for our life. 